Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, the two networks you love and now we end the trilogy with the Disney Channel Iceberg. Wait, 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 wait. In case you don't know me and you're questioning why a funny bird is talking on screen, let me explain. An iceberg is a list that talks about theories, fun facts, or anything related to the subject. And it goes from most known to least known. And this is the Disney Channel iceberg. But you already knew that, you clicked on the video. Growing up, you might have watched Core in the House, A Dog with a Blog, Gravity Falls, or even the most recent Big City Greens. But that doesn't matter, because we're all in the same boat listening to an annoying bird spew his verbal garbage from his beak. Yes, 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 I know. When it comes to icebergs, I know a lot of people have a lot to do, so this is more heavy on audio than visual. So while listening to this iceberg, I recommend you do anything that's productive. If your room is dirty, clean it. If you're an artist, keep drawing or start something new. Go for a walk, do something, just do something while listening to this. And hey, if it's late, you can fall asleep to my crisp audio. Is it pretentious to say that? Yeah, but... Who really cares? Before this video starts though, please comment down below what's your favorite Disney Channel show. I'm actually interested because, you know, there's so many different generations of Disney. So let's see the age range around here. Also, we're getting close to 40k subscribers. So don't forget to subscribe and like this video. It helps me a lot and also helps this video perform well. But if you're not convinced, you could wait until the end of the video and make your mind up then. My channel also has other iceberg videos if you want to continue watching more or just watch some before this one. Look, you just go through my channel and find them. Also, I have other projects that are not just icebergs, so give those a watch too if you want to see moi. All right, before we delve more into this iceberg though, there's a uh, one more thing. I I'm sorry. You already know how it is. This video is sponsored by Wondershare Demo Creator. You want to make creations like these? Well, you can. You see, Demo Creator is an easy to use software for screen recording and video editing. You could use the recording software to record your MW2 clips so the world could see how good you are. Look, I know Adobe and other softwares could be complicated, so Demo Creator makes it easy. Because like Chef Gusto said in Ratatouille, What do I always say? Anyone can edit a video, Remy. You have the tools to help you create content like text and annotations. You also have animation effects like explosions or advertisement features, so you too could shell out. Also, you have these cute little stickers and sound effects that could accommodate you. And if you want any more of the stickers and stuff, you could look at the effects store. You also have a lot of masking options. So if you too are a pretentious film junkie, you could add black bars to trick people to think you're cinematic. And all you have to do is just drag and drop these effects, like blur, zoom, or even the green screen, for example. You also have sick transitions that could be dragged and dropped. And like any other video software in the world, you could speed up or slow down footage and also change the blending mode of layers. It's simple and new user friendly. So if you too want to make videos without much stress, please give Demo Creator a try. Trust me, we all get bored and we don't have that much money, so please, I recommend you do give it a try. I'll leave a link down in the description below, so go check it out. Once again, thank you Demo Creator for sponsoring this video, and now let's return back to the iceberg. Spot the Diff Spot the Diff or Change Nader Nader is the name given to a two-hour special of Phineas and Ferb in a mini-marathon. The marathon is based around a scenario in which Dr. Doofenshmirtz has made an invention that he calls the Changer Nader Nader, with which he can make various changes, particularly visual ones, to certain episodes of the show. The changes are shown through specially made promotional spots airing between each episode, with redubbed animation from The Fast and the Phineas. As a challenge, the viewer watches the four selected episodes and their modified counterparts while keeping track of which changes are made as a part of a tie-in to the official websites. To be honest with you, I know about this, but I didn't know too much about it. See, as a kid, I only watched Phineas and Ferb and turned my brain off half the time. I wonder if they ever found where Perry was, though. Pixel Perfect So Pixel Perfect is a Disney Channel movie from 2004. It aired on the United States on January 16th, 2004, and in the United Kingdom on January 1st, 2004. Um, I was born in 2002, so I definitely did not watch this. Any of you old dinosaur bones in the comments, if you watch Pixel Perfect, tell me more about it, but I'm assuming it's on this iceberg because <laughs> nobody knows about it. Most demographic probably watching this video is young, and there's different scales of young, like 2002 young to like 2005 young, maybe. Only thing I was watching was probably Nemo and Pixar movies. I wasn't that focused on the Disney Channel yet. Going Wild with Jeff Corwin. So this is a nature documentary television series produced and aired in the late 1990s on Disney Channel, hosted by Jeff Corwin. The show lasted for three seasons from August 10th, 1997 to June 13th, 1999, before it was cancelled. Corwin travels to natural places around the world, including Florida, South Africa, and Hawaii, searching for wild animals. In each episode, Jeff searches for a feature creature and always finds it by the end of the episode. The creatures that were previously featured include the manatee, cobras, crocodiles, bighorn sheep, and dolphins. As he explores, Jeff looks for the creature clues to help him find these animals. And then in some episodes, Jeff even includes ancient ruins. That's pretty interesting. Like, once again, like I said, I'm from 2002, so of course I didn't watch this, but researching it is like fun. I mean, when it comes to nature, guys, I just know about Steve Irwin, which, uh, rest in peace, but yeah. 
Suzy Q. Suzy Q is a 1996 super RTL movie that originally aired on that channel, followed by Disney Channel airing it in the United States in the mid-1990s. Justin Whalen, Emmy Jo Johnson, and Shelley Long starred in the movie. The movie told a story of a teenager dying with her boyfriend on the way to a winter formal back in the mid-1950s, and coming back to her old house about 40 years later in order to help her parents avoid being kicked out of their trailer park home. Disney Channel stopped showing the movie late in the millennium. It was given a TVG rating, and it was already cut for some profanity, but not all. That's it, though. Dude, I don't even know what super RTL is. Did most people even watch cable? If you watch cable, tell me down below. If you know about this movie, once again, tell me down below. Close Encounters. I try to look more about Close Encounters, but I don't know what it's speaking about. There's multiple episodes on Disney Channel called Close Encounters, from different TV shows, but that's pretty much it. But with that, I'll end Layer 1. That was pretty quick, but like I said, there's way more to come ahead, so stick around. We're gonna get into Layer 2 now. Layer 2, Jesse Gluten Joke. So this episode had a lot of controversy with it. Some parents were mad about the derogatory statements about children who need gluten-free diets that were made on the show Jesse, which led the company to pull this episode off the air. But here is their statement. To our viewers, we received your feedback about tonight's Jesse episode, which some of you access early on video on demand. Oh my god, who actually uses video on demand now? Jeez. Disney said in its statement on its official website, We are removing this particular episode from our regular programming schedule and we will reevaluate its references to its gluten restrictions and its character's diet. Please accept our apologies for the upset this episode caused you and your family. We value your feedback. Thank you for watching Disney Channel. Now please, don't pull out of our stocks, we want money. So yeah, the Jesse episode is called Quitting Cold Koala. It revolved around Jesse having to take care of a kid named Stuart, and Stuart has a gluten-free diet. Several jokes are made in the episode about his condition, including the main character Jesse pointing at Stuart who had a five-page list of dietary requirements and got mad at him. Also another character says, you call me sweetie again, you'll be eating some gluten-free knuckles. Also another gag had a child throwing pancakes at Stuart as he screams gluten and wipes his face. And then Luke says, he makes me look macho. Once again, rip, Cameron Boyce. So yeah, a lot of this layer is going to have the sensitive society type stuff on here. All I'm saying, it's it's a gluten joke. It's a kid's show. Nobody even knew about what the hell they were watching. Kid doesn't really know what the hell gluten is. They'll just eat what they eat and they'll watch what they watch. It's not that deep. But I guess if this did offend you, I, this didn't offend anybody. Let's be real. Like I said, kids don't know what the hell they're watching. But yeah, shake it up eating disorder. Yeah, this pissed off Demi Lovato. So Shaken Up had an eating disorder joke, and then Demi Lovato ended up getting mad and tweeted about it. So Demi Lovato also got mad about the So Random, which was also tied with Sunny with a Chance and how they made anorexia jokes as she was dealing with, you know, eating disorders at the time. I don't know too much about this. This is pretty easy to look up. She just got mad and made tweets about it. They apologized. That's pretty much it. But this also has to go into something else called Hannah Montana, No Sugar Sugar, which I'll talk about now. So No Sugar Sugar was supposed to air on November 2nd, 2008 and be the finale of season two. But the episode was pulled due to complaints from the parents that belong to the nonprofit Children with Diabetes organization after watching a sneak peek at the episode on Disney Channel On Demand. Now we just have Disney Plus. Parents of the organization saw the episode being in poor taste and being completely misinformed of its main topic. It did air on Disney Channel networks though, internationally, however except for the United States. The episode was then reevaluated and modified, and then it released on September 20th, 2009 in the United States. According to Mitchell Musso, the episode was also edited and some scenes were reshot, and the episode was then changed to uptight, Oliver's alright. Even though the original take was pulled, the original episode aired during a rerun once on December 12th, 2016 at 6 p.m. Eastern, most likely as a programming error. But that's it for layer two. Now I'm gonna go to layer three and we're gonna talk about this. Two news. In 2004 to 2005 for the UK, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Disney created a CGI series of promotional international shorts called Toon News that'd be aired on Toon Disney. It starred a cowboy robot newsreader called Smokey Silvers, who wears boxer shorts and cowboy boots. He'd be in a blimp that was above the skies of Toontown giving news to the audience following the short. It was comical and short. It was supposed to be a comedy. They put in clips of airing Toon Disney shows and try to make some kind of news stories out of it, such as with like Hercules and people. Also, some way through the series, Smokey's nephew Spike would come to join him, which at first he would be annoying and scared all the time, you know, be a little bit of a coward, but then he would just move on about it. It was nominated for a BAFTA and helped Kathy McDonald win both the Best Newcomer Award at the Pro Max Europe 2005 and Young Creative in Europe Award at Pro Max Athens. She intentionally researched for it, becoming the director, going to write and direct all 26 episodes. She also co-created the two characters, to which she created Spike and developed the characters character of Smokey. Animators who worked on it, including Johnny Gru, Nathan Laud, and Han Park. Mark Harrison was the producer and Stuart Pearson was the executive producer. Smokey's also voiced by Lewin MacLeod. Footage from the series it still exists online, but it's scarce, and in no way it's completing all 26 five-minute episodes. Some things are re-uploaded, but that's pretty much it. Masterpiece. Masterpiece Theater is an American television show that ran on the Disney Channel and also premiered on other channels launch day in 1983. Oh my god, that's old. The show is a spoof on the PBS show, Masterpiece Theater, presenting Disney animated shorts. Get it? Masterpiece, masterpiece, yeah. 
Yeah, you get it. On to the next one. Disney Interactive Studios. On June 5th, 2008, Disney Interactive Studios and the Walt Disney Internet Group merged into a single business unit, now known as Disney Interactive Media Group, in 2009. In 2009, DIMGS, Disney's online unit, purchased multiple websites from Caboose. In July 2010, Disney Interactive purchased Playdome for $563.2 million for its mobile division. In January 2011, DIMG closed its propaganda game studio and laid off about 200 employees later that month. The dual presidents placed a new game on the back rock, Junction Point, Avalanche, Wild Load, and GameStar under its new development of Chief, with a new publishing unit to handle marketing and production. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, interesting to people who think it's interesting. I was just laying it there. That's what I found. Stanley. Stanley was an animated television series that was aimed to preschoolers that aired on Playhouse Disney from 2001 to 2007. This is in my age demographic, but still too young. The series was created by Jim Jenkins, creator of Doug and PBJ Otter. Ooh, I talked about Doug, by the way, on a different iceberg, the Nickelodeon one. You probably saw that one. If not, uh, here's a little hey, to the right of the screen. You could find a click for it. But it was also created by David Campbell. Stanley discusses a wide variety of issues that preschooler children face, including change, growth, rules, and dealing with... Th that's Cap. I'm sorry. No preschooler cares about anything. They're sticking cranes in their nose, being stupid. Remember Toy Story 3, where they go buck shit wild and start, like, doing all this? Yeah, that's what preschoolers do. This is complete lie. But each episode centers on an animal that deals with or helps explain the issues that Stanley's dealing with. In 1999, a pilot of the episode was sent to Disney to see if it would make a full-fledged series, but it never aired due to Stanley's design being a bit too scary for young audiences. The pilot was called Kangaroo Cleanup, but with different scenes. Most of it was reused in an episode later of the series called Stanley's Parents' Room, but it just looks completely different, having a purple setting. And Harry looks completely different as well. Stanley's voice actor Jessica D. Stone also voiced him in the pilot episode. His mom and dad were voiced by David Landsberg and Ari Myers. Respectfully, while Dennis and Harry's voice actors are currently unknown at this time. That's it for Lair 4, though. We're going to be moving on to Lair 5. Thanks for still sticking with me. That's pretty sick. See you there. Fall Apart Bomb Squad. Fall Apart Bomb Squad is the 17th episode of Bonkers, although it's actually the 9th in chronological order. So a crazy tune bomb who wants to be a stand-up comic terrorizes the city, and Bonkers has to take the case with their new explosive expert, Fall Apart Rabbit. The episode was removed from rotation in the United States after the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing due to its bombing slash terrorism plot, and was consequently never re-ran on Toon Disney. This was before Disney even became more strict with, you know, 9-11 happening. It is though available to watch on Disney Plus in the US. That's... <laughs> Okay, I think there's a couple more in this iceberg that have to do with terrorism. That's pretty funny though. It has to do with, you know, bomb defusal. Of course, in 2016, I played a lot of CSGO, so nothing changed. I was still dis disarming and planning bombs, so suck it, Disney. Just kidding. I don't want to be on Disney's bad side. Mini Takes Care of Pluto. So Mini Takes Care of Pluto is a Minnie Mouse cartoon short from Mickey Mouse Works, despite this short being labeled as Minnie Mouse Short. It focused on Pluto instead of Minnie. So the short was pulled from ABC to never be shown again in the US, due to complaints about it being short and frightening. Can, however, still be seen outside of the US. So this short and Pluto Gets Paper are the only ones who are not shown on Mouse Works shorts. So yeah, this short is not shown to people, but I'll read some of the complaints that people said. So there's a complaint about an image that has poison berry jelly that's put in Pluto's bowl, <laughs> and Minnie laughs evilly as Pluto remains to eat the bowl. A second image spots where Minnie buries Pluto alive. A third image spots Minnie trying to kill Pluto with the mace. And there's a part where there's a nightmare of Pluto going to hell. Okay, that makes sense why it's not being shown to little kids, but okay. I'll move on. Flying Dupes. So Flying Dupes is the 65th and final episode of the Disney animated series Tailspin that premiered on August 8th, 1991. Jeez, dude. So many old things. If you watch Tailspin, let me know below. This episode was only shown once before it was banned from the lineup, most likely due to its terrorist theme. <laughs> Most likely due to its terrorist themes. Once again, Disney, what with the terrorism. The only other time it was aired was in 1999 on Toon Disney, which was most likely a mistake. It's also not included on iTunes or Disney Plus, despite having been released on DVD in 2013. The episode also includes a cameo of Nana from Peter Pan, if that makes you feel nice. Like I said, guys, I told you, I think the next one has to do with terrorism as well. Geez, Disney, in the 90s, you guys were going buck wild, huh? New Partners on the Block. So New Partners on the Block is the 32nd episode of Bonkers. It's notably the last of the Lucky Pickle episodes in production order. And such is the last episode with Lucky as Bonkers' partner, with Miranda Wright becoming Bonkers' new partner at the end of the episode, bridging the gap between the two different sets of Bonker episodes. This episode was removed from the rotation in the United States after the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing incident, you know, due to the terrorism plot, once again, like we said. But you could still find it on Disney+. Plus. All right, with that, I'm gonna go to Layer 6. Thanks for sticking with Layer 5. Happy to have you here, but we're gonna be moving on now, so let's go. Kim Possible Ringtone. I don't know what this has to do. This might have to do with it. It's just the Kim Possible ringtone. I, I think it was available for times on people's phones back then. If you had the Kim Possible ringtone, tell me about it. 
Cory is the best anime. So this is about the big ass meme about Cory being, Cory in the house, DS being the best anime. I don't know why this is on here. It's kind of funny though, all the way at layer six, but yeah. Tell me, if you think Cory's the best anime, tell me in the comments. Go, go down there right now and tell me if you think it is or not, but I'll move on. The Disney Channel Circle of Stars. So the Disney Channel Circle of Stars is a Disney Channel supergroup comprised of various actors and actresses from a variety of Disney Channel original shows and movies. The purpose of the group is to perform modern renditions of classic Disney songs to attract a young audience. And it's also to advertise special releases of Disney films, specifically The Lion King's Circle of Life in 2003 and Cinderella's A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes in 2005. They returned with a new team in 2014 for Do You Want to Build a Snowman? <laughs> Do you guys want to build a snowman? Disney's Friends for Change, also referred to as Friends for Change Project Green, is a pro-social green initiative that started in the summer of 2009. Disney's star stress environmental issues is in the campaign. The year-long campaign draws on how Disney stars connect with young fans. Selena Gomez, Miley Cyrus, and the Jonas Brothers, and also Demi Lovato are stars amongst this. This also might be crazy to say really quick though, but there's some people who do not know these people were Disney stars. There's young people who think Selena Gomez was just a singer out the bat. Same with Miley Cyrus. No, these people were on Disney. So to all the young Fortnite playing people, <laughs> I cannot believe I just said that, but yeah, this is real. But what they would do is provide two minute public service announcements, you know, currently airing on Disney Channel. That would tell them to preserve the planet and to go to the Friends for Chains website to register and pledge, in which sometimes they, you know, would. As a part of the initiative, kids would also have the ability to choose how Disney will invest one million in their environmental programs. Chad X Ryan. Okay, so Ch Chad and Ryan are people from High School Musical, and it's this is just referring to a bunch of fan art made of them that they're in a you know gay relationship and just has them kissing. And I I'm not gonna show that much of it on screen. N not that it makes me uncomfortable. You know, Happy Pride Month, of course, but. I don't know. I'm just gonna show fucking lewd porn on screen for a Disney iceberg. Are you serious? Hannah Montana alternate ending. So included in the Hannah Montana Forever final season DVD, there's an alternate ending to the episode. The alternate ending picks up from the airport scene where Miley and Lily say their goodbyes as Lily goes to Stanford and Miley goes to Paris to work with Spielberg and Cruz. The camera then pans away from Miley and Lily hugging and zooms onto a little girl sitting in a chair, holding a Hannah Montana doll. The text, Tennessee 12 years ago, appears that shows the young girl portraying young Miley Cyrus playing with a Barbie doll, singing a song about herself becoming a famous rock star. Miley's real life parents, Billy Ray Cyrus and Tish Cyrus, walk into the room, tell her that it's past her bedtime and tuck her in. Miley then says, I'm gonna be a rock star one day just like daddy. Then Tish tells her that as long as she keeps believing in herself, she can do anything she wants to, and Billy Ray tells Miley that someday her dream will come true. The scene eventually shifts into a photograph of the real life Miley and her parents, suggesting that like Miley Stewart, Miley Cyrus imagined herself being famous one day and her dream indeed came true. That's kind of cool, so it just connected the two universes. They never used it, but that was awesome. But Miley Cyrus, you did become popular, making songs with Kid Leroy and swinging from wrecking balls. You know, round of applause. Zoog. So Zoog Disney was introduced in August 1998 and was the most distinct of the three blocks, compromising Disney Channel's original series aimed at preteens and teens. So it was hosted by an alien slash robot hybrid characters called Zoogs. They are figures that were given mature voices in 2001 and was designed to help encourage viewers interactivity between television and the internet. The Zoo Disney brand will then later be expanded, with most of the channel's weekly schedules outside of the Vault Disney and Playhouse Disney becoming a part of Zoog's weekend's umbrella block from September 2001 to August 2002. In early September of the year, Disney Channel would then begin, you know, gradually rebranding, beginning with killing, you know, the Zoo brand from air use. To be fair though, that is kind of a stupid ass name, but you know, it does come back. After relaunching Vault Disney to 2014, the question was asked if Zoog Disney would be a part of the Vault Disney or, you know, just be a separate channel. It was decided that Zoog Disney was going to be a separate sub-channel, sharing some of the programming from Vault Disney. So on January 1st, 2015, Zoog Disney returned as a sub-channel and is now one of the candidates for DN's children block. Had no clue what the hell this was. Like I said, 1900s, not a part of my era. That's crazy for me. Arwen. Hey, you guys remember Arwen from Sweet Life of Zack and Cody? So Arwen was a project by Danny Callis, produced to be a spinoff of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. The project wasn't picked up, of course, though, because, you know, nobody's talking about it. There's no nostalgia of Arwen. So, of course, the series wasn't picked up by Disney Channel. Although other series spinoffs were picked up. But rather than focusing on Arwen, The Sweet Life on Deck featured adventures of Zack and Cody, London, and Mosby on the SS Tipton, as well as the teen studies at Seven Seas High. Additionally, the new series added the characters of Bailey Pickett, who was played by, you know, Debbie Ryan, who replaced Maddie Fitzpatrick as a series regular. That's weird to think that Arwen was gonna get his own show, but then, you know, good thing not. 
I liked Sweet Life on Deck more. That's kind of weird though. I actually have more nostalgia of Sweet Life on Deck than Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I was younger during Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, but I actually did watch Sweet Life on Deck. What's Stevie thinking? So this was a spinoff to Lizzie McGuire. The show centered around Miranda Sanchez and her sister and parents and her best friends trying to help support wildlife conservation camps at Australia. The show centered around Miranda Sanchez and her sister and parents and her best friends as they try to help support wildlife conservation and help at Australia Zoo with crocodile hunter Steve Irwin and his friends and family. Like I said, Steve Irwin. Yes, we talked about him earlier. Once again, rip to the guy, but aw. That's, that's a cute episode. That's a cute show. I do miss Steve Irwin a lot, but no, respect the Stingray still. The 65th episode rule. So the 65th episode rule was a controversial rule that applied to Disney television shows, particularly during the late 1990s and early 2000s, stating that no show could go beyond 65 episodes, which is two or three seasons. This rule angered many Disney Channel fans due to the fact that so many shows had to get canceled while they still had huge fan bases, such as Lizzie McGuire and Even Stevens. After initially ending, after 65 episodes on February 22nd, 2005, Kim Possible was renewed for a fourth season on November 29th, 2005, making the show the last subject to this rule. No other show on the network has been canceled due to this rule since. That's pretty stupid. Nickelodeon had a lot of rules like this too on that iceberg that I covered, but good thing they removed that. That's so dumb. As of 2018, Marvel's Avengers Assemble officially broke the 105 episodes rule. With its fifth seasons, Marvel's Avengers Black Panther's Quest, which premiered on September 23rd, 2018. As of 2015, the combined run of Sweet Life of Zack and Cody is the longest running show at 158 episodes and a movie. Although Gargoyles is listed as an exception to this rule, it should be noted that the show's last 12 episodes aired as a part of the show's third season, subtitled The Goliath Chronicles, and are not considered to be you know, made by the creator Greg Wiseman. It adapted the first two issues of 2006, and the canon rule was also kind of not applied. The TV show is actually 66 episodes long, just narrowly making the exception to this. Recess could also technically be considered, you know, an exemption to the rule, as ABC wanted an order for more episodes from 2002 to 2003. However, Disney declined on making another full season worth of episodes. Only four new episodes of Recess were made, bringing the full count up to 69. <laughs> 69, that's a funny number. But they were never actually aired as episodes of the show. Instead, three of them were made together as Recess, Taking the Fifth Grade, while the last one was released as a Recess, All Grown Up. The rule officially ended in August 2004 when Disney Channel ordered 13 additional episodes of That's So Raven after the show had filmed its 65th episode. Kim Possible originally ended after 65 episodes with the movie So the Drama, intended to serve as the show's last three episodes. But due to popularity, the show was picked up for a fourth season, like I said earlier. This is considered the turning point for the rule. And since then, the only Disney show that ended at exactly 65 episodes was Ant Farm in the March of 2014. Damn, I remember Ant Farm. That's cool. The reason they did this, though, is for economic reasons, apparently. They did the whole math about why 65 episodes is enough for airtime, but I don't know. That is very limiting to directors and also people who enjoyed it. Perry X Doof. I really, really do not want to talk about this. So there's a thing of fan base with... Um, <laughs> How do you even speak about this? So people shipped Perry the Platypus and Doofenshmirtz. It's a literal platypus and Doofenshmirtz. The people wanted them to have a relationship. You probably, I'll, sh I'll show this one, but it's the funny image where like he's pregnant. This is ridiculous though. It's a platypus and a man. Like you guys got to calm down. Dream Finders. So Dream Finders was an unmade television show proposed for the original Disney Channel lineup based on the Journey into Imagination attraction. It featured Dream Finder, here known as Old Eli, taking children on adventures through the realms of imagination while avoiding a villain named Fear in his dark realm of the wilderness. That's super original, right? Yeah, only three scripts were completed on the D23 website, and the series never officially filmed. According to screenwriter Doug Williams, who wrote the first episode titled Just in Time, just as the show was building ahead of steam, Michael I Eisner took over of, you know, Disney Studios and shut down the production for no apparent reason. Other than that, you know, it's a common practice that, you know, with change of powers, you close things. Look at Star Wars, for example, you know, Rip 1313. Xenon, Girl of the 21st Century. So Xenon, Girl of the 21st Century is a 1999 Disney original movie starring Kristen Storms. The film was originally conceived as a pilot for a potential television series, but the series never got off the ground. Nevertheless, the movie proved popular and warranted two sequels, Xenon the sequel in 2001 and Xenon Z3 in 2004. I'm guessing this is on here because most people don't know about this, at least millennials do not know about this stuff, so that's interesting. Disney's Coyote Tales. So Disney's Coyote Tales is a television special that aired on Disney Channel on March 24th, 1991. Through redubbed footage of the Coyote's laminate, the Coyote's relationships with a man and dog is shown from the Coyote's point of view. <laughs> that's it though, I guess, Coyote's Tales. So that was a long lair, but thanks for sticking around. We're gonna go to lair seven now, and we're getting, you know, to the end of this. So <laughs> thanks for being here. 
I'll see you there. White Rabbits Can't Jump. So White Rabbits Can't Jump is the unaired 99th episode of Adventures in Wonderland, but the episode was pulled from release after O.J. Simpson was arrested in 1994. Though the episode was never aired, it was adapted into a picture book. The White Rabbit gets some help from his hero O.J. Simpson prior to his 1994 you know, criminal trial when the residents of Wonderland hold an annual athletics competition, and he's afraid he will lose. <laughs> That's crazy. As you guys all know though, the juice is on the loose. But back then he used to inspire tons of children. Now he's a massive backstabber, if you know what I mean. Well, who knows? You know, juice. Juice is on the loose. Deadly Force. So Deadly Force is the eighth televised episode of Gargoyles and the eighth episode of season one that is arguably the most controversial, you know, the episodes. So in the episode, Broadway accidentally shoots, you know, Alyssa with her gun and racked with guilt, he takes her to the hospital, then goes off on his own to take his frustration out on criminals. They assume it was the work of a gangster Alyssa was investigating and set to take him down permanently. Those initially pulled from rotation due to sensitive subject matter of gun safety, which was the theme for the episode. It was later allowed to be re-aired, but with censorship edits made, which had digital moving of Alyssa's blood when she was shot. That's pretty crazy. You had people, you know, busting caps at each other in Disney. <laughs> That's never gonna happen again. Hot Spells. Hot Spells is the 86th episode of Darkwing Duck, and it was first aired on Halloween Day of 1992 and was quickly pulled from general circulation due to it having satanic themes. This is the only episode omitted from any show, you know, in its US digital release despite being available for purchase in Germany. This was one of the four Darkwing Duck episodes that was banned after its initial airings, the other three being Tiff the Titans, Beerson Thug, and A Duck Phobia. However, unlike the other three banned episodes, Hot Spells has never been on release on VHS or DVD, and is only unavailable for digital purchases on iTunes and Disney+. Plus. Last Horizons Last Horizons is a 32nd episode of the Disney Afternoon animated series Tailspin. The episode was banned for reruns due to its saturation of World War II and stereotyping of Asians. It occasionally reran on Toon Disney, well, you know, the last time being seen December 2002, and is not available. So the episode satirizes Asians, specifically Japanese people, and has to do with the Emperor wanting to bomb somewhere, which is like referencing Pearl Harbor. Yeah, Disney wanted to be a little bit brand friendly, you know, moving Moving forward, so it makes sense why they did this. But that's the end of layer seven. We're gonna be going on to layer eight now, so <laughs> once again, like I said, stick around, keep watching. If you're already asleep, then um, here's my voice. You're gonna keep hearing it, so thanks. Tim Burton's Hansel and Gretel. So filmed for 116,000 on 16 millimeter film, this live action short film featured a cast of East Asian American amateur actors. Also Kung Fu fights and Japanese toys, as Burton was obsessed with Japanese culture at the time of the production. The film's design and style paid a homage to Godzilla movies and featured heavy special effects, such as front projection and forced perspective, even some stop motion animation. Though some people claim that the full film's run was 45 minutes. The version released on YouTube in 34 minutes and 17 seconds, with the credits cut off. This is due to the film being being paired with Tim Burton's Vincent short film and various bumpers. This is actually really interesting though, because you know, Hansel and Gretel's usually has to do with like forest taking place in like old Europe or something, but taking it to like a Godzilla theme, that's super creative. Dreams in the Attic. A New York Times article states that the special was screened at a museum of modern arts as part of Tim Burton's special exhibition. If you know anything more about Dreams in the Attic referring to Disney Channel, please tell me down below in the comments. Don't Look Under the Bed. So Don't Look Under the Bed is a 1999 Disney Channel original movie. It is also Disney Channel's second and final attempt at horror, the first being Tower of Terror, which you know is also an attraction at Disneyland, and was the first DCOM to be rated TV PG due to its frightening content. Though the film was well liked by fans and critics, it allegedly received some complaints by parents who felt that it was too scary and dark for young kids. Disney apparently had similar problems when producing the film with dark themes in 1980s, especially the 1983 film Something Wicked This Way Comes. Once Disney made the switch, these movies then became a little bit gradual, such as Tower of Terror. That's it about Don't Look Under the Bed, and that's all. That's it about this lair. We're going to lair 9 now, so close to the end. Or I might have got the numbers off, I don't know. I'm just going through this, we'll see. Ooh, okay, so a lot about this lair has to do with the cancellation of some Disney people, and I'll get into that to now. So this has to do with Vanessa Hudgens. In 2007, 18 year old Hudgens' privacy was compromised after a nude photo had surfaced online about a year after High School Musical was released. At the time, the Disney actress issued a statement apologizing to fans and expressing regret for taking the photos. In an interview with Cosmopolitan UK that was published, Hudgens said that it was a traumatizing time for her. This is her statement. It was a really traumatizing thing for me. It's really scary that people feel like they're entitled enough to share something that's personal with the world. Hudgens noted how fans can feel entitled to celebrities' privacy. As an actor, you completely lose all grip of your own privacy and it feels really sad, she said. It feels like that shouldn't be the case, but unfortunately, if enough people are interested, they're going to do everything they can to know as much about you as they can, which is flattering, I guess, but then people take it too far and end up getting too personal. That's weird though, because there's a lot of criticism about some YouTubers nowadays, such as Dream and stuff about 
you know, crazy fan bases. And this is completely about her in that situation. Devin Leos. So this was the guy from, you know, Mighty Med, but after Mighty Med ended, he found himself having run-ins with the law. Most recently, an ordeal that landed him three months in jail in 2019. However, the formerly child actor seems to be getting back on the right path, using his newfound success to give back to homeless communities, to, you know, right his past wrongs. But Brown was best known for his role as Eddie Thomas on the hit Disney channel, like I said, you know, Mighty Med. And he was actually arrested for marijuana possession. He made headlines again in 2016 when he was charged for battery and meth possession. And that was the first time that, you know, he very publicly battled the drugs and mental health for the former actor. I don't know, there's debates to be had about that. That might be kind of stupid, but that's what this, it says in this iceberg. Miley Cyrus scandals. The then 15 year old Disney star came under fire in 2008 for posing for a cover of Vanity Fair wearing nothing but a satin sheet. While she apologized at the time, she changed her tune, you know, 10 years later. I'm not sorry, fuck you. She tweeted alongside a 2008 issue of the New York Post, which ran, you know, the photo. I agree with her on that though. Back then, child stars were forced to apologize for anything, but it is, you know, freedom of expression. Good for her. My, Miley Cyrus's bong video. Before Hannah Montana rapped, there's a video of her smoking weed from a bong in 2010. I'm not perfect. That's what she said about the scandal. She said she made a mistake and I'm disappointed in myself and my fans. Then she claimed about being, you know, an icon and stuff. Mitchell Musso's DUI. The former Hannah Montana star was arrested and charged with two counts of drug driving in October 2011. Musso struck a plea deal in February 2012, agreeing to 36 months and, you know, probation. Also, you know, alcohol education classes and a fine of a thousand dollars. Shia LaBeouf, bizarre behavior. Oh, Shia LaBeouf is on here. I don't think it's talking about his recent stuff though with like battery. I think this is like the things you could find in Honey Boy. So he was made headlines in 2014 after he arrived at the Cannes Film Festival wearing a bag on his head that said, I'm not famous anymore. LaBeouf gave a series of cryptic and bizarre interviews that following month. But with the bag, you know, people were like abusing, pulling fingernails and stuff. He's made multiple statements about that. But that's it for Shia LaBeouf on here at least, but there's so much more about it, but I guess you could find different things about that. You know, tell me what's your favorite Shia LaBeouf film in the comments, if it's Transformers, I swear to God. Debbie Ryan's DUI. So she was booked for driving under the influence in June, 2016. After playing no contest to a charge of reckless driving, Ryan was placed on three years probation and to complete a DUI program in community service. That's crazy. Now she's with the drummer from 21 Pilots. Good for you, Debbie. That was it for layer nine, guys. We're going to layer 10. Damn, this has been a long iceberg. Hope you're still here. Jeffrey Jones. Actor Jeffrey Jones, playing the prominent starring role of Chairman Clinch, was a major coup from Disney and Lucas. The acclaimed thespian in his classic deadpan delivery earned praise in films throughout the 1980s and 90s. However, in 2003, Jones was arrested on some very disturbing allegations regarding minors. Yep, here's this is this layer, folks. You're down in the iceberg. Pedophilia is coming. After pleading no contest, Jones was placed on probation for five years and required to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. Subsequently, he was arrested twice for not updating his sex offender registration as required. It did not go unnoticed that shortly after his 2003 arrest, Disney closed up his, you know, alien encounter show. Disney closed the extraterrestrial alien encounter. Brian Peck. On this iceberg, it says Brian Peck. That's pretty funny. But he was an actor who was 54 and was in two X-Men movies and all three Living Dead movies. He's now featured in a controversial documentary on pedophile abuse in Hollywood. Brian Peck served 16 months in prison after admitting two counts of abusing a Nickelodeon child actor. Damn, see Nickelodeon still manages to find a way to be in this iceberg. He was charged with eight counts of sexual abuse, including abuse by anesthesia or controlled substance. Since released from prison, he has been a dialogue coach. He worked on a Disney series as well and claimed to be friends with Charlie Sheen. Only banned for direct contact with children, so he's still able to work on series, but just not with underage actors. That's pretty scummy, but... Uh. I guess that, that's how they get away with it, right? Victor Salva. So Victor Salva, a former childcare worker who impressed Hollywood filmmakers with his early cinematic work. For example, he made the Jeepers Creepers movie, if you remember that, was sentenced to three years in state prison in 1988 for molesting a 12 year old boy who had acted in two of his films. Salva videotaped one of the encounters as well. Complete fucking scumbag. Stoney Westmoreland. Westmoreland was fired from his grandfather role on the made in Utah Disney Channel series, Andy Mack after his arrest last December. His film credits include Godzilla and Matchstick Men. He has pleaded no guilty to the charge. Lewis said he had spoken with his agent who acknowledged that he would normally drop a client facing such allegations, but hoped to work with him in the future. Plan, she said, to point her client's good reputation. She empathized that no images of child pornography had been found on any of his devices and what she called highly unusual occurrence in such cases. Yeah, that's it though, pedo would. With that, we're gonna go to layer 11 and this is just really short. Lilo and Stitch slash Handy Manny signal intrusion. So in 2007, someone hijacked Playhouse Disney and interrupted Handy and, and interrupted Handy Manny with porn. This happened again on Dish Network in 2012 on the Disney Channel in North Carolina, which had Lilo and Stitch 
which was supposed to play, but instead, uh, porn was played. Jesus Christ, people were going crazy with that, huh? So that's the end of the iceberg. I wanna take a second to say thanks. When I first made the Nickelodeon iceberg, I was around a thousand subscribers, and now I'm at 36,000 cents. The growth has been crazy, and I'm super grateful. So much could happen in such a short amount of time, so who knows where we will be at by the end of the year. But this is all because of you. I just wanna take a second to just thank everybody who subscribes, comments, and just likes these videos. You're doing so much for me, and I'm just super grateful and appreciative. Also, thank you to the channel members. You guys are awesome as well. So much could happen, and this is just kind of overwhelming, but for real, thanks. Also, thanks for watching to the end of this video. That's awesome as well. If you wanna watch any more icebergs, I have some on my channel, but I also recommend you watch the other projects. Once again, like, share the video, subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Skipper. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. I chain smoke till I choke. Have a beautiful